Uh, welcome everybody back to Left Reckoning. Um, I am joined today, I'm very happy to be joined today uh, by Lillian Tchurchia, um, postdoc at the Free University of Berlin, um, studying and uh, an expert in social philosophy. Did I get your name all right? Yeah, it was fine. You're <laughs> almost there, real close. I'll work on it for the next time. Because uh, for folks who aren't familiar with Lillian, uh, she is the co-host of this really great show that you should be checking out called What's Left of Philosophy. Um, I'm a big fan of it. I've been listening to it for a while now. Um, it's a show where you can check out, you can check it out on Patreon and all the other places that you listen to your podcast. And they have really insightful and accessible conversations on topics all the way from Althusser to dialectics, to Hobbes, and more. And I wanted to invite Lillian um, on today to talk about a book um, and, and two thinkers, hegemony and social strategy, Chantal Mouffe and Ernesto Leclau, um, that it's, it's, a, it's a book that is very, very relevant for us to think about on the left today, because even though I wouldn't say that this is a book that is being equipped by many of our political opponents, um, there are ideas here that have really percolated throughout the American left wing circles and certainly across Europe. And I think really need to be addressed and debunked. Before we get into all of that, uh, how are you doing today, Lillian? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited for this. Um, well, let's just uh, let's introduce this a little bit. Um, so this book is sort of important for me just because when I was at school, uh, my last semester, I was able to take a course on Marxism. Um, which was a really great course uh, taught by one of my favorite philosophy instructors, uh, who was actually a disciple, um, and a, a disciple, a student of Ernesto Leclau. Um, and reading uh, Leclau for the first time uh, was, was interesting just because of the way that it was sort of framed me. I was reading this in 2015. Um, and Ernesto Leclau had uh, sat down with uh, my professor all the way back in 2002, uh, right when American intervention and neoconservatives seemed to be the ascendant political movement, political philosophy. And Ernesto <laughs> uh, Leclau looks at him, he says, well, what's coming next is populism. And the next two decades are going to be decades of populism. So for that, I had always had this feeling um, at least the way he was introduced to me of these folks as people who really had their finger on the pulse of philosophy and, and politics. Um, but this book, Hegemony and Social Strategy, which was written in 1985, um, really, really is, is a, politically, I would argue, a train wreck. Uh, it doesn't really lead us to where we need to go. They come up with all of these wild theories, including uh, con uh, presenting themselves as post-Marxists. Um, we'll get into all of that in a little bit, but I was wondering if you could, because I'm sure you'll do a lot better job of me, just sort of introduce the book, Hegemony and Social Strategy for our audience and what they're sort of touching on. Yeah, okay. So I think it's so interesting that you framed it in terms of somebody having read it in 2002, which was a period of like neoconservative hegemony, mm -hmm. just to use their word, hegemony and social strategy, and that they were kind of anticipating a, a populist wave. Um, I'd like to know more I, at some, if we have mm -hmm. time, just about like how press, like how prescient they that was, and what it meant to argue for the kind of thing there they've been arguing for, especially still. Chantal Mouffe is arguing for this kind of left populism mm -hmm. in the context of that neoconservative moment, because I think it like how attractive these ideas are to you kind of depends on the political period in which you're reading it like reading it in 2015 when you start having a left-wing option like Bernie Sanders feels rings kind of different than reading it in 2002 when there is no option and you feel like working at the discursive margins of the population and the polity is the best thing that you can that can happen so those are those are two different like these are either going to be compelling ideas or they're not going to be compelling ideas. And I think it sometimes it has to do with whether or not what is actually happening politically. So to introduce the, the book in its own context in 1985, um, I think that this, the best way to understand this is it's post-Marxist and we can talk about what that means, but importantly, it's post-New Left. So the New Left, um, 
there are lots of radicals with all due respect, you know, like they're people who were socialists, they were Marxists, they were expanding and experimenting with theories and different, so in the new social movements, but also in labor and so on. But there were these percolating criticisms of orthodox Marxism that began as early as the 50s and the 60s as deindustrialization and deindustrialization started to happen in the 50s. You got this fragmentation of the working class, the, the starting to weaken of some of the traditional anchors of working class power. And then you get these new social movements, the feminist movement, um, the civil rights movement, all kinds of stuff. Um, and people started thinking, okay, the working class isn't the subject anymore. You know, the Marx Marxists thought, think of the working class as a revolutionary agent. And it just seemed like they weren't. So for like 20 years from the 60s until this book is published, the 80s, I think the best way to contextualize it is that it came, um, it was the culmination of a 20 year period of trying to fill the gap that the working class had left. So the working class, for example, in the United States, the trade union movement becoming increasingly bureaucratic, conservative, took the no strike pledge during the war, um, there's a kind of home ownership, suburbanization thing going on. And so then you get students' movements, feminist movements, civil rights movements, and it just starts looking like, okay, maybe the working class wasn't it. Mm -hmm. Other things, might, other groups might be it. And there was this search for the new subject. Like, for example, you can think about Sylvia Federici or Selma James, the autonomous feminist movement, where they thought maybe the housewife is like the revolutionary mm -hmm. subject. Um, Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism, also maybe um, the Black radical tradition, Black people specifically are the revolutionary subject because they can reject not just capitalism, but the whole world as it exists. Mm -hmm. um, third worldism had this char character, the student movement, you can think about Marcuse, he was writing in one dimensional man, like maybe not the working class, but the students, they can be revolutionaries. Okay, so by 1985, this causes fatigue. And Laclau and Mouffe write this book and they say, um, there is no revolutionary agent, period. So that, you know, mm -hmm. not only is there no class agent, there is no, there is no revolutionary subjectivity. Instead of thinking that there are these social groups that you can mobilize for whatever reason, or like the class in itself that you want to turn into the class for itself, there is no in itself. So yeah does that I hope that helps to no I mean it, it definitely okay. does and you know and it's it's an interesting book because again you know it's supposed to be a book of, of social strategy but from the get-go there's a you know very much a rejection of you know of the kind of politics of, of Marxism mm -hmm. um, including some weird redefinitions of things I mean for 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 both of them you know class starts to become less of like an economic position as much of an identity, right? Um, which is why, I, I, again, I, I find this to be very interesting to sort of read and critique today because there is a kind of liberal discourse around like what being a working class person is, right? Things like when people use terms like classism, right? Oh, it's like, oh, well, you like these kind of products, that means you're of this class instead of it actually being the more scientific concept of like, do you sell your labor to a boss, right? So there are all of these redefinitions that are going on there and it's because in my reading, they have a real unease with what they call essentialism or any proper definition um, for things, correct? Yeah, they, I mean, I think that the, the primary argument is, is that the, the working class is not special mm -hmm. and, and we couldn't fill the gap that the working class left, which means there is no gap to fill. We are just fragmented subjectivities. And we are just trying to articulate ourselves with different kinds of symbol symbolism and discourses. And this is always overdetermined. So you can never actually congeal a social group with common interests to do anything in particular, at least over the long haul. You know, not the way the trade union movement thought, okay, there's this group of people, they share interests. Um, and we can try to get them to see that they have these interests in common and then we can get them to work together. And then if they work together, they might form a common, a collective political subject. The argument in this book is fundamentally that like, there is, is to abandon the idea of this being possible as a durable project. You can only kind of articulate, 
yourself in a milieu of other individuals contingently, symbolically, discursively. And I don't know, I think that the relationship to the idea of identity is very ambiguous in, in this mm -hmm. text, but, but I think you can see why, um, like why it fits so nicely into the identity discourse, because mm -hmm. eventually at the end, you know, what kind of group do you feel like you're a part of? Other people you identify with. And the reasons you identify with people could be a lot of different things. Like it could be race, it could be gender, it could be sexuality, it could be, um, you know, just different cultural signifiers, anything really. And um, it's the instability of our identities and that we're all just, um, that in order to kind of create cultural hegemony, we have to just pull them together just at different moments at different times. And there's no system logic to this. It's just, we're in this constant project of contestation. And I think if you were to say, what does left populism mm -hmm. mean? That's it. It's this constant um, contestation with other individuals, accepting that our relationships with each other are always fragmented and partial. Um, I think it's worth asking why this is compelling and feels liberatory to some people um, at like at least in the eighties or 2002, as you were, you were saying, um, and why to some of us, it feels like such a limitation on our political possibilities. But I think for a whole generation of people, this felt like, oh, thank, you know, thank God we don't have to worry about workers anymore. Like they, they seem stuck in the mud, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, 100%. And then also, I mean, you, it has to be noted too. I mean, we're seeing the decline of, you know, of, of the communist world at this point too, right? This feeling that the great dream, you know, the alternative essentially, that was so um, unifying, at least earlier on for, you know, leftists and socialists had sort of disappeared. And obviously this is way past when, you know, people heard about the horrors of Stalin. Um, but, you know, there's this crisis moment and I do feel like that, that looms very, very large. Um, that any time that you do have some kind of, you know, determination or, um, you know, some ideas like, okay, this is the working class. The idea is that once you define something that everything outside of it, like must be destroyed. Um, and it's like, a, that's a real sense of anxiety that you get with, with Mouffe um, and Leclerc, right? Is that like you're authoritarian, basically, if you assert um, any kind of truth about society or any functionally, like really any kind of definition um, about society either. I think that, um, it's the beginning of, or maybe it's the beginning of the end of a long process of the um, moralizing of structural posi mm. positioning and causal relationships. So um, I think that to be fair, the social, the socialist movement did have a sort of like, you know, workers are there, there was a lot of optimism about what working people could accomplish. And I think like rightly so, um, there's also, I think, some moralism about, you know, being the right kind of worker, the right kind of discipline, the right kind of virtue. You know, if you look at uh, posters from like the SPD or the KPD and Germany in the early, in like the, in the Weimar period, you've got these like virtuous, strong men and, mm -hmm. and they're like, um, so, so there's, there's this way in which, you know, morals and a sense of ethic and and the, the importance of this particular group of people lends itself to like you know we're the center of the struggle um but i think that the thing that matters more is why you might they might have thought that which is the kind of structural leverage that these people can have over the people that dominate everybody in our society and so i think what ended up just getting wrapped into this criticism of class politics is this um, conf like conflating the idea that people have a set of structural opportunities and potential kinds of capacities to exercise leverage, create obstruction costs, and that you might be motivated to organize with one, or one another for those reasons with a kind of privileging discourse. Like you think these people are more important, they're, mm -hmm. they're better, they're more virtuous, they're more ethical. Um, and you can see why people would have thought this, but it's also kind of incredible that um, that really took over. It really took over th for, for Leclau and Mouffe. They, like the whole book is trying to assail the, the faith that people had in the workers' movement, trying to assail the idea that these people were special. And so there's these highly moralistic overtones that are kind of shocking, um, you know, looking back 
looking back on it, I, I find myself reading the text wondering, like, why do you hate these people? So, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. These are, you know, these are regular people who sorted themselves out into political parties and, and trade unions and, and you have so much aggression towards how special we thought they were. Um, but do you see what I mean? Like where there's this kind of antagonism toward the center of the mm -hmm. capitalist system? No, for, for sure. And it is, it is funny historically. And I want to save our, our conversation for sort of, you know, what's happened really in the past decade because left populism um, you know, really became a, a kind of, at least if you're reading, you know, publications like the New Left Review or Jacobin or stuff like that, you know, that was a word that was used many, many times to describe a lot of different political movements I actually think had very different contents from like Bernie Sanders to like Podemos to Syriza. I think that they're very different contexts, but they have similarities. But anyways, we can get into that um, in a moment. Um, because it's it's interesting though the kind of disdain that you do get from them for the working class right because like look there is this challenge at the end of the communist manifesto right workers of the world unite and i do think that it is fair to sit there in 1985 and just you know look around and be like okay where you know why did this not happen but there are lots of arguments in the marxist tradition that address this um um, I, I think it, it's not something that hasn't been considered, but I think it's, you know, fair game to look as to, you know, the historical reasons, especially in the United States, um, why, you know, there wasn't a strong uh, workers party that developed um, there. But it's, it's so interesting, though, to read their kind of disdain for the working class, but also their attachment to the term Marxist, right? Because post-Marxist is a very funny way of framing um, their argument, because ex-Marxist um, would work just as well, right? But they really emphasize this idea that to get to our position, we had to go through the Marxist tradition. You had to become more radical than it. You had to be, take the position within the academic and intellectual left mm -hmm. as being the um, kind of tribune of what counts as left wing, what counts as radical. And you know, there's a kind of saying in, among Marxists in the academy where basically everyone wants to be a radical, but no one wants to be a Marxist. No one wants to be a socialist. Um, so there's this kind of important leverage that post Marxism of this variety gets from Marxism, which is that it only counts as radical or left wing because it has surpassed, superseded or otherwise undermined, but the word has always gone beyond Marxism. This is very important because if you read this kind of text and you read and you compare it with like just liberal sociology and the social social sciences, like pluralist theories of the state, you know, like mm -hmm. there are different interest groups and we are all vying for power within the state. You know, we can have our um, lobbying groups, our NGOs, our nonprofits, our different constituencies, our community groups. And we are all just trying to create, you know, influence the government to do what we want. And it's a free marketplace of ideas. So whoever wins that context will shape public policy. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's pretty interesting that like, for the most part, that is what they think that like, mm -hmm. you just want to create your, uh, a head with, but they use different language. They use hegemonic block instead mm -hmm. of an interest group. You want to create a hegemonic block. Um, and the reason this seems like radical is because it's supposed to be going beyond Marxism. And so that's why Marxism remains important to mm. post Marxism. It's a way of positioning oneself. You know, I'm not a liberal, I'm a radical, but I'm, I'm not one of the vulgar mm. radicals. And, and I think that, you know, if I, if I can kind of speak to people, like if you go into a, um, like a, an undergraduate seminar in the United States, this is very difficult to understand. Like when I entered the philosophy world, I thought that we were all just building on Marxism. Like I took a Marxism seminar with David Schweikart. It was called Marxism and Existentialism. I thought it was so dope. I was like, yes, mm -hmm. this is how the world works basically. And then I took other seminars on Foucault and Nietzsche and so on. And I just thought we were building. Like we were just getting deeper and deeper. We were understanding power better and better. Um, and then at some point I realized, wait, the whole architecture of this is to undermine the, the, the theoretical foundation that Marxism laid and kind of sneaks up on you that that's what's mm. happening. And I think that, yeah, I think that's worth saying that that's basically in my, in my opinion, that's kind of what 
the niche post-Marxism fills. I, I would very much agree. You know, w- when I first read this text, it was extremely disappointing uh, for me, especially because of the way that the course was laid out. It's like, you know, you start with Marx and you do Lenin and you're you know, getting fired up and then you get to the end of Marxism, you know, and I, I was a, a double uh, major in, in political uh, science and in philosophy. Um, but it was really disappointing to finally get to the end of, you know, this book that's supposed to be the capstone of like the Marxist tradition. And essentially it felt like something that I would read in a political science course, which is, as you were just saying, how can we create new communities that are going to show up and vote for us? You know, and, and at a certain point, um, I mean, you could maybe spend some time, you know, taking apart some of their conceptions, but like take it at the, at, at its best. And it almost becomes like a neutral system, Right. Where it's like, this is the same kind of thing that Karl Rove is doing when Karl Rove was like, okay, we're going to turn Texas red, right? He's like, okay, well, let's think about the different identity groups within the state that we can get to vote Republican, right? Like, this doesn't seem very revolutionary or radical. Um. <laughs> and interestingly, you know, I, I, they're European, so it's kind of a, a different context that they're responding to. But when you think about the two party system in the United States, like we think about them as being the left and the right, you know, mm. relatively in the American system, but American political parties are really just like conglomerations of ide- ideology. You know, like if you mm. think about the way that they've shifted over time, it's not a clear left and a right with a clear constituency and political project. It's actually like pretty interesting to see how they morph ideologically over mm. time in a way that if you look back on like what the Whigs are doing and what the free soil people were doing, you know, just mm-hmm. in you're like, wait, how did all these people fit together again? Um, and so like in the American context, there's a way in which these ideas about just um, the, the pluralism of it, it, it's intuitive to Americans because that is kind mm. of how we already think about politics within our political system. We don't, we think about kind of get engaging in like a hegem like a two polar hegemonic battle. We don't think about building a specific political constituency based on specific interests. And this is a very big challenge for socialists. And there's a reason why it's an argument that's so difficult to make because it's not the way our political system works. So um, I think that if you're gonna talk about the way this is received in the United States, I think it just, it, 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 it seeps in in a way that feels natural to, to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. I know, I, absolutely. And that's an interesting point about the way Americans think about politics. I hadn't considered that before. Um, 